This is Runehammer. distant world, one of the Asterian megaplanets known as Aster 12, in the jungles beyond the old stone bridges which are now choked with vines and other weird plants from times forgotten, there's a small group of squogs, bubble helmeted, breathing that strange liquid they do, and they work furiously, even through the freezing nights of that weird planet, digging excavating, searching, and down beneath what was believed to be a towering stone ruin, in fact the nose cone of an ageless starship, and there in the black soil it's finally revealed, tiny green lights blinking, and those three that found it are vaporized instantly. This is nothing less than the RPG mainframe. Episode 20, RPG Mainframe 20, RPG Mainframe 20, 20 episodes of RPG Talks right here on Runehammer. Greetings programs, my name is Hank Renfernell, welcome back to the podcast. Whoo! Can you believe it? It's 20 episodes of this madness. That I think I deserve this sip of coffee right here. Mm. Oh, Kona. So good. Welcome back, everybody, and thank you for your ongoing support of Runehammer. We are creating RPG stories, legends, theory, deep thinking, all right here on Runehammer. Thanks to you guys. You're the bomb, and we have made it to freaking 20 podcasts. I can't even believe it. I had no idea where this was going to go when I started out on the journey, and you guys have just let me know that it is worth doing, so... Every week, have to sit down for a few hard hours and think, hmm, what do we really need to think about this week? So for episode 20, I wanted to do something sort of way off the map as far as the usual drill here at Runehammer. But before we get into it, um, you know, I'm down here in the basement of uh, Runehammer headquarters. Every few seconds, another envelope plops through that hole in the ceiling, and I think I'm expected to read and sort all this mail. Kick off that mailbag music, will you, maestro? Mailbag day, mailbag day. Let's go see what's in the mail today. <laughs> mailbag day, mailbag day. Let's go see what's in the mail today. <laughs> oh, man, it gets dumber and better every single time I hear it. <laughs> okay, so let's start off with a pretty big mailbag. Uh, so first of all, there's an interesting trend that's been occurring in the mailbag, um, which is that the questions actually seem to be thinning and they seem to be slowly morphing into more like statements, which is kind of interesting. So um, last year, it's like lots of questions. How do I do this? And what does this mean? And what's the deal over here? Questions about ICRPG, stuff like that. I think between 2E improving and there being more YouTube and people sort of catching up and maybe I hope the quality and explanation of things improving. These sort of bafflement questions seem to be on the redux and more statements about like what people have been happening at their table have seemed to be imp improving or increasing. It's kind of an interesting trend. I get 
between 10 and 50 messages per day between YouTube and Facebook. And so you do notice like statistical trends in what people are talking about. It's very odd. And sometimes they're definitely like hacking and baffled and need help. They're setting up campaigns. They're, you know, they're trying new things. They're making classes. They're making monsters. But then other times they seem to be just smooth sailing and saying, hey, here's what happened. Pretty cool, huh? Thumbs up. And it's interesting because it is statistically noticeable that these trends occur. Maybe it has something to do with seasonality or, I don't know, I haven't figured it out, but it's really interesting. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention. And then we've got some, some doozies here. Okay, so the first one that was kind of gnarly, and we've talked about it a little bit, but here it comes again and again, is my players totally owned my boss character. So I had this boss monster Players walked in and like two-shotted this thing. And it was supposed to be this big climactic battle. And they cruise in. I have this giant spider monster. It has like four hearts. And the battle breaks out. And these like this guy rolls a crit on Death Nova. And boom, the spider's blown to pieces. And I'm kind of like, oh crap. So what, what did I do wrong? Well, first of all, uh, to answer this, I would say, first and foremost, you did nothing wrong. It's totally okay and honestly expected that players would rally their biggest effort against your biggest monster. And then if you combine that with a really high dice roll, that's just called cruel justice. I mean, that that is what players are built for, is to every once in a while output this massive spike of damage um, based on the synergies that they built their character with, right? They, they didn't build their character so that they get pwned by a spider boss one day. That wasn't their dream. Their, their dream was to kind of role play through a lot of stuff and then when the time came to just like drop this nuclear bomb of damage that they designed their character to um, be able to do. And so when they get that fulfillment moment, as the DM, yeah, it can be a little frustrating because you put a lot of thought into something. But as a player, they're like, oh my God, did you see that? So first of all, you did nothing wrong. Second of all, you can, if what you're really wanting is difficulty and supreme challenge, you can set it up, but I would have to say buyer beware a little bit because if you make really deadly and really difficult sort of boss monsters or boss encounters, you have to be ready for the fact that you could wipe them out. And uh, I have some personal experience from very recent times on this front, which is that I had a vampire in my epic difficulty dungeon last week. And within two rounds, my players entered this chamber and were all killed. And I don't mean like knocked down so we could do a story TPK. I mean decimated, slain, killed outright because of the way that I did Akasha, my sort of vampire queen. Now, how do you do a boss that has this level of deadliness? Well, you do anti-magic capabilities that she has. You have to stop the players from using all these gadgets and tricks. And so it can be a cone, it can be a spell, she can use counter spell. It could be an area where magic suddenly doesn't work and um, strike fear into the hearts of players. You can also destroy loot. You can also have a boss that works in conjunction with its environment. So it, it uses the timer in the room or truncates the timer in the room to make the room deadly in itself as an action. This is like how the Kraken electrifies the water, right, as a legendary action. This stuff is gnarly because there's really no way to fight it for players. As long as your monster is just a thing that needs to be hit, and can be avoided, and damage will be done to it, it's going to get beat. But if the environment is a big part of the boss's weapon set, you, you can't destroy the entire environment. So that's going to make it a lot more powerful. Also, and I know this is on a lot of podcasts and, and um, different sort of GM advice resources online, but the biggest way that you can make a boss difficult is not hit points and damage, it's actions. It's action economy is what it's also known as in D&D. And that means giving your boss three actions or even, um, you know, repost type actions or response actions. So if blah happens during the fight, this boss gets a free action at that instant. That makes them insanely difficult to beat because they're getting so many actions done. They're casting. I had three actions on Akasha. And so it's my turn and I'm casting three freaking spells just on my turn. So it's like fighting three characters in a way. Um, and it gets very difficult. The other one that I experimented this time that made my boss so stinking lethal is that I looked at my players and what they had access to and I took a few of the things that they have and put them on my boss so that she was at a comparable power level. Now this may seem simple, but it makes your monster so powerful because 
player characters are extremely powerful. So if you match their level, oh boy, is it frightening. So that would be my advice. First of all, it's okay if your boss, your boss gets owned. And second, try some of those tips to make your boss really difficult. But be ready because you're going to be a killer. He's a killer. Killer. Okay, the next one is a bit of a refrain too, which is that um, spell progression in ICRPG is sort of too open. You know, where, where is it? What do I do? My players don't really want to switch over to ICRPG because they don't see the spell progression. First of all, I would say, yeah, that is a justified critique on ICRPG. I intentionally removed a lot of the linearity of spell progression. And I think for a DIY type dungeon master, this is very freeing. But for a player who's um, sort of doing this sort of option catalog behavior, you know, like I want to look through my option catalog and, and shop. I want to go shopping for my dream character. For that type of player, the game is probably pretty dissatisfying, but the intent of the game here is to let the dungeon master DIY a progression for his player on the spot. Now, is that asking too much of a dungeon master? I don't know. This happens a lot in ICRPG, is that I just ask you to go ahead and come up with it. So let's say you have this player and you want they want to play ICRPG and you want to answer their, their desire or their dream. What I recommend trying is to make yourself a little tech tree. A tech tree is an old term from like RTS games back in the 90s, you know, like uh, Warcraft or Dune. Um, and what you want to do is just make, literally draw a little tree. It starts with two nodes in a line and then there's a split and then those two nodes each have a split and then there's three nodes deep past that. And this provides characters a sort of one-way trip down the tree. You show them all the options that are available on that tree and they're going to move through, and when they're awarded a milestone, they're going to pop to the next node on the tree. It's all really simple. It's just up to you to pick those spells based on a theme, like this is the Fire Mage tree, and then also decide during play when is a good time to say, ooh, yes, you just realized the nature of fire in a deeper way. You can move to the next node on the tree and take that spell. But the key isn't even so much what happens during play. It's showing the tree to the player at the beginning, at the, at the inception moment which will get them that buy-in. It's this feeling of seeing what's going to be ahead, like dreaming up this super-powered fire mage that they don't have yet, but they can play toward. That aspiration is a big part of why D&D works so good, is that players love D&D. Now, I would argue the more 5e begins to age, dungeon masters are starting to dislike it. But I think as a player smorgasbord, it's a beautiful, beautiful game. I mean, obviously, all the art is amazing and all, but as far as like, Catering to player dreaming, I think D&D is pretty brilliant. So we'll see how Mordenkainen's is. Uh, mine should get here today, I think. But Because um, to me, the monster books are the key that makes a dungeon master excited in the way that spell and feat progression makes a player excited. So this is what I recommend. Set up this tree at the beginning. Let them view it and drool over it to get that magic effect, and you might get a little more buy-in. Okay, the next one. <laughs> this is a funny one. I, I bet... This will be surprising to some people, but I get loads of questions about first edition ICRPG books. Can I get first edition? I want first edition. Like it's some kind of vintage thing or something. Okay, so I just want to clear the air and uh, you guys can help me get the word out on this um, on whatever sort of social media outlets. But the first edition book is not worth fantasizing about. <laughs> it's so much smaller, has so many more errors. Um and also just has such such a, a reduction in the clarity of the writing compared to 2E. It's really not worth wanting. Now, I could see if you're like a completionist collector, that's, okay, that's kind of quaint, but you're going to have to, you know, pry that 1E book from the cold dead fingers of the early adopters. Because I think now that book is truly sort of going to be in the past, and those, I hope, in a few years, those who have it, we can look back and and that is going to be sort of a, a neat garage band version of the game that came out early and a small group of people were there for that. Now, we're still adding a lot of readers. Um, already just by going on to Amazon, we've added 300 new readers uh, in the last few weeks. And I think it's going to continue. So I think 1E will disappear in time as a desirable. But for the moment, it's still asked about a lot. And let me just put it to bed. The first edition is gone. It can't be published or created in any way. The ones that are made are all that there will ever be, and, and that's it. 
Okay, the next one is, how would I go about making a path for a class or character? So this is someone who got worlds, was intrigued and excited about the path concept, you know, the path of Amber and so on and so forth. And how do I go about making it? Now, I think there's still a little bit of a mythic uh, view about what kind of game design theory or principles are used to develop milestones and paths in ICRPG. And again, this is sort of a clearing the air thing, but let me just throw it out there. There is no theory behind it. It is simply sitting down and thinking what would be cool. And you can ask um, my, my weekly players, some of these things are like kind of way overpowered. <laughs> Remember that, that word that I've kind of discounted or disliked in my YouTube video about it? There's some really powerful stuff in there, like regeneration stuff, where every round you're regenerating 1d6 HP and stuff like that. I mean, these are really powerful objects. And, uh, you know, does that imbalance or sort of, you know, world break the game? And I think the answer is no. It just puts a burden on the dungeon master to understand escalating danger. Do you have things that are dangerous enough to accommodate players who can regenerate hit points every single turn? And basically it asks, can you do one round kills on characters with your designs? Is that something you want in your game? But I can tell you there's no mathematical magic behind any of the path designs. All they are is you take a theme, like let's throw it in something, uh, something known. Let's say you're doing like a supers game and you have a Spider-Man type character and you want to do the path of Spider-Man. Well, you know, it starts with stuff like super strength, with web shooters, and with super agility, but then he moves forward to the, to the iron spider equipment, right? And then maybe even he has like um, the, the web ball, which is like a giant like cocoon you can put an enemy in, or he can do the sort of a slingshot thing, the giant web that like is between two buildings that shoots in really far, and some of these crazier Spider-Man abilities. Just design them out and put them in a sequence. There's, there's no mathematic magic to how those paths are built. It's a simple matter of knowing your theme, coming up with stuff, and putting it in a sequence. Or even better, the more ICRPG way is put it in a pile, and the character, upon progression, upon milestone, chooses from the pile to build it their way. And so I, I just want to demythify path creation. I want to demythify progression. And I know that this puts a burden on the dungeon master and a little bit on the player to be creative, but that to me is the DIY spirit that separates the game from more prescriptive games like Dungeons and Dragons that say, here is the path. Here's the progression. You use slots, you get this at this level, go to the level, blah, 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 right? I really like the approach of here's a pile of things. You can make it linear, you can make it nonlinear, you can award it, uh, you know, based on XP, you can award it at story moments, do everything, because I really believe in the DIY freedom spirit. Okay. Um, the next one is <laughs> kind of an interesting little detailed one, and this is about the last one I wanted to do for Big Mailbag is a funny question, is Alfheim tiny? <laughs> so someone calculated the distance across Alfheim based on the map with the 50 mile marker, and they said it's only about as big as New York to Indiana. That's about how far across Alfheim is. And yes, that is correct. Alfheim is about that big. So you could consider Alfheim yeah, to be sort of a third of the United States in its scale. But what I would actually suggest is that is not small. That may be small in the modern sense of space, but if you're walking wherever you go, that is a massive, massive area. So imagine even walking from, say, Seattle to Wyoming, right? Oh, I can't even, geez, that would be a journey, right? The sort of the Oregon Trail. <laughs> um, yes, that's how small Alfheim is, but I think... It's interesting because that is a scale worth exploring in a fantasy setting. So if you move Alfheim down and the northern tip of Alfheim is about like where Montana is and the southern tip of Alfheim would be like where, um, say, Texas is, you get that range of, of uh, environments and weather and you know, ecosystems and stuff like that. But to walk across that space is, is just massive. Even to just do something like to walk across Montana would seem really big. You get mountains, you get river country, you get the, the plains, you have a lot of different terrain. And at walking speed or even horseback speed, it's a huge area. 
One uh, movie I really loved to drive this theory home or this feeling home was this kind of violent movie called Bone Tomahawk, which beware of this movie. There's some pretty graphic violence in it, but it's this Wild West setting where they have to ride their horses out like uh, 30 miles outside of town into the, into the wilderness. And 30 miles, well, that's nothing. Well, when all you're doing is walking, you're on horseback, it's hot, you have limited food and limited water and stuff like, it gets pretty real. Another way that uh, uh, this was driven home for me is when I walked across Spain a few years ago. You know, we're walking for weeks. And, it, and, and we're like, wow, we're just covering this massive swath of Spain and then finally looked at the map like, no, no, like, actually it's just this tiny little part. And Spain isn't even that huge of a country. So I think that's my answer is yes, Alfheim is small compared to something colossal like the United States. But in a fantasy setting, I think that is going to drive home the realistic scale that works with walking. I think walking from New York to Florida or New York to L.A., to me is too big for a fantasy continent. That is just massive, which is probably more like sort of the size of like a Feyron and stuff. Anyway, so that's my answer to that. And that is the episode 20 big mailbag. Oh yeah. Zabadoo, zabadee, here comes the main part of the P-O-D-C-A-S-T. All right, guys, so I wanted to switch it up just a little bit and go off the map. <laughs> well, ironic to say, but go into the map is more like it for episode 20 of RPG Mainframe. And this is a, a response to Gary over at Murder Hobo Show. And of all of the different requests for, um, you know, deep dives that could be done and topics that want to be talked about and curiosity and so on and so forth... I found this one to be truly unique and, and a bit surprising and kind of like, well, that sounds interesting. Yeah, I think I could get into that. Let's do that. And that was Gary's request to do a lore dump about the cities of Alfheim. And so that's what we're going to do right now on RPG Mainframe. We're going to talk about some of the, the bigger areas and cities in Alfheim and some of the lore that is not written in any place you can really get it directly. Now, if you really are into Alfheim as a setting, you know, not necessarily just as using it out of the book, but as, you know, DIYing it into your game or, you know, dra drawing inspiration from it, you can get the most detail out of the novels. And I'm really, really proud and excited to release that trilogy book, The Legacy of Mud, that just came out on Amazon. I am... It, to me, is my first work of fiction that is truly complete. It's a huge book, 500 pages with 21 illustrations um, and a map and everything. And I feel like I, I really made it to the finish line on that project, which took more than three years. It was That was a really huge endeavor to get that done, and I really hope that sells well because, to be honest, that is where I want to go with my, with my career, with my work, is I really want to write more books like that. And so that's where you can get a real a deep dive on Alfheim. Okay, but let's say you're not really a novel reader, which I think most of my RPG readers aren't really huge novel readers. At least that's what the sales would suggest. And so short of that, I'd, I wanted to do a podcast today, which is just a nice deep lore dive on several key areas inside Alfheim that maybe haven't been fully explained or talked about that might be interesting seeds of adventures or campaigns or one shots that you might be doing with your group or plan on doing with your group, whether it be online or at home. So the first location I really wanted to talk about was Inglemore. Okay, so Inglemore is a small town in sort of southern central Alfheim near the Greenway. And this is particularly significant because it's really featured in the second book, The Shield of Hanar. And that town is uh, delved into quite a bit its history and exactly how it got there and what it's been through. But to make that long story short, Inglemore is built on a series of caves in the limestone which date back to, to proto-man. So when mankind was still like under the heel of the serpent kingdom in the early days of Alfheim, th there were sort of proto-men that lived in these series of caves. As the age of men unfolded, these caves became more like catacombs beneath a town, and they were used for burials, and then eventually 
sort of Inglemore became darkened, and this is back when it was called Ardenmore. It was ruled by this family called the Ardens. And they were sort of cultish. They worshipped the Ogdru and other sort of old gods from the serpent era. And they concealed their activities in this series of catacombs under the city. Now eventually, after the sort of wicked ways of the Arden cult were discovered, the townsfolk of that area, in, in sort of a night of hellish retribution, destroyed the Arden family, burned the catacombs, and the whole thing was sort of uh, scratched off the monuments, if you will, and the town's name was changed to Inglemore, and basically the catacombs became forbidden. As the centuries passed, the catacombs wound up being reopened and used in the most, a little bit horrible way imaginable, as a prison and as an asylum for the insane. Now, the town was not dark and evil anymore, and so this asylum or this prison was actually on the up and up. It was a good place. Now, this is a bit of a, a dark you know, um, habit or behavior of medieval cultures is to you know, confine the insane and so on and so forth. But this was their only solution, and it was done with the most humanitarian intentions in mind. But there's a strange thing about uh, places that are delved deep in the earth is that they, they tend to be tainted with or breathing with sort of ancient evil and it just sort of keeps returning. Something about the deep earth invites dark forces. And in the second book, these sort of tentacle creatures that do wind up coming up out of these catacombs. Now what I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit with Inglemore isn't necessarily just the details that are in the Shield of Hanar, but exactly what the kind of... Uh, expanding lore of this town are. I based this town on the town of Santonia in Spain, which uh, is home to one of the no no most notorious and terrible prison disasters and tragedies basically in human history. And if you want to read up on that, feel free. It's in the 1500s. It's pretty crazy. But I think this is what's interesting about Inglemore that lets you play as a dungeon master, is that this town is built on such an old site that it's it's both a powerful set of roots for the town, like it has this, this great deep history that you can improvise into, right? You can write your own chapters of what has happened in the past that is either affecting positively or negatively, like the, the scope of Inglemore's story. Or you can take that forward, and this is kind of a little bit what Santonia freaked me out about is like this long past of these caves was now being sort of uh, repackaged. So what was once an asylum becomes a prison. What was a prison actually becomes an underground cathedral. What was an underground cathedral actually becomes a bunker. And then what's a bunker actually becomes a sort of a bastion for the rebellion. And, and the rebellion is now a force of good that uses this kind of ancient site. And then also I love ancient sites because you're always discovering new parts of the ancient site that were previously buried or lost, right? So let's say Inglemore does sort of clean up its act and the catacombs are no longer a prison or, you know, they, ha they no longer house any darkness, but there are occasionally, you know, rats down there that need to be cleaned up or maybe they need to be maintained as an archaeological heritage site and your players are doing this and they discover a sort of a false wall. There's actually a chamber behind here or a newer set of tunnels or the floor collapses and leads to subterranean caverns. But either way, I like the idea of a town built on a miniature underdark and, and where this could go and what's needed to do in this town. So, of course, there's a town above ground, but the focus of this town is this ancient site that's below. And I think that's very interesting. And then I think another uh, idea that I eventually wanted to toy with is there's actually a transit system that's under this town. So maybe it could use a system of portals or even just really long tunnels or maybe tunnels that uh, great worms have dug that leads to under chambers of other towns in the Greenway and beyond. And so Inglemore, I think, is a really fun sort of base of operations town for a group because it sits centrally, um, but also because it's built on this ancient site that has like this ever-revealing history that you can easily DIY and create and add your own chapters. So that's a little bit more about Inglemore. And then there's the Ardens. Like maybe the Arden family was never vanquished. Maybe they're still around. It's this, uh, this almost like Templar type feeling or like witch hunters. You know, they're sort of 
overzealous, kind of righteous, uh, you know, evil vanquishers who are totally evil in themselves. <laughs> so a common theme in some of my stuff, like in New Haven. Um, but the Ardens are really old, and maybe they just concealed themselves when they were defeated. They weren't vanquished entirely. So a little more about Inglemore. Okay, next up we have another one of my more uh, detailed areas in Alfheim, which is the town of Westburg. Now this one is uh, greatly delved into, into the first book, Mud and Horn, uh, Sword and Sparrow. Uh, it's also been explored in Hathor Dur and the Rangers of Namidia stuff that I've been doing on YouTube. But I think what's most interesting is what's about to happen with Westburg, which uh, if you guys listen to Hathor Dur, Underneath this town, there is actually sort of a time rift. There's some kind of rip in time, and there was this elder worm, a great worm, that was feeding on this time rift. It was somehow eating the energy that was calving off of this rip in the time continuum. So first of all, whoa, what is that all about? How, how does a worm eat time energy? And what does that mean for the nature of the worm? Is it in, in multiple times, or is it like shortening time, or is it creating an alternate timeline? I don't know, but I just want to offer hooks that could create ideas for DIY dungeon masters out there. But to me, what's interesting about this sort of worm that's feeding on the time rift is the unexpected results of this happening. And, and what I would like to do as a dungeon master in Westburg is actually begin to reveal new and strange effects of this time rift. And they could take the form of something like a warp stone. Right, so if you guys remember my mapping session with uh, Nate Vanderzee on WASD20 um, last year, we did this whole kind of brainstorm on this, this warp stone idea that had changed the, um, the prince of the town into this rat creature. And like a warp stone is kind of a MacGuffin that can explain all kinds of story hooks. It's a, a stone, a location, an object, a relic that is emitting evil energy. And the, the idea of the warp also comes from 40K, right? It's this, this subspace. And when subspace leaks out, it, it taints, corrupts, mutates, and changes things in all kinds of different ways. And it's sort of a source of infinite story fodder. And I would propose that the time rift under Westberg is very similar. You've got a chance here to really muck about with when things are happening, your ability to retcon them, your ability to go back to the Serpent Kingdoms or forward into a spell jamming time. Also, like, what is going on with creatures that feed on time, and how could you play with that? And then, more interestingly, how could you battle a sort of a time-devouring creature? Would it be sort of like a phase spider type fight? Maybe it would fight like Doctor Strange in a way, where it's like moving in and out of, of time portals, and you're chasing it down through these centuries. Maybe Westberg has different versions of itself and your players are trying to reassemble or align those versions to bring it all back together and sort of seal or, or uh, repair or heal this rift in time. Either way you do it, I'm not as interested in exactly what's quote-unquote true about the time rift or what the sort of the big truth is. I'm more interested in about proposing open-ended questions that are very weird and interesting. And I find this one sort of fascinating. Why is there even a rip in time there in the first place? That's my first biggest question. And it probably has something to do with Lydia from the first novel. You know, this sort of arachnid, elven, you know, kind of drider type character who regrets her own evil. She's sort of lost control of her own evil power. And what's her connection to the rift, to this time rip? And and, and how can that be worked with and played with? And I would love to bring her back as a big bad in a campaign and think it would be awesome. She's really cool. And these are all just little moments that aren't really fully fleshed out in the books, but I think are just ripe with opportunity for you to play with in your campaign. So that's a little bit more about Westberg. Just remember, you know, Westberg was this, this military force to be reckoned with when the elves were at their height. And now, after the flood, <clears throat> after the fall of Ladea, you know, and after the time rift formed, and then the worm, like, hollowed out under the town, and, like, the town's in ruin, and Zymer and Helm are trying to rebuild the town when Stills gets taken by Durathrax. 
And this is tying all these little threads I have together in all my podcasts and videos into something that I hope can provide you with a few more seeds of a town with a deep history and how you can play with it and reveal it to your players. Okay, the next um, sort of deep lore dump we're going to do on Alfheim, thanks to Gary at Murder Hobo, we're going to talk about Ramthas, the, the Rock of Ramthas, or Ramthas Rock as it's also known. So again, this location appears in a couple of my novels, actually I think it's in all three novels really, but is never truly delved into, and I, and I like that part. There's a couple little hints um, in Worlds and a couple little hints in Core, but really has not been talked about in detail. And uh, same with um, uh, Duramoro. The, so these are sort of my dwarven parts of my world, even Iridrum um, in, the, in the West, <laughs> uh, haven't talked about in great detail. And that is largely because I have not quite become ready. And now the dwarves are so close to my heart that if I ever do go in depth with these locations, I want it to be so perfect and so good. I think I've kind of shied away. But for the sake of this podcast, Let's just talk about Ramthas Rock for a minute. Ramthas Rock is my thinly veiled tribute to Minas Tirith. So the first sort of basic uh, lay of the land here is that there's this massive stone formation that's out in uh, sort of central eastern Alfheim. And a, a city has been built into it. And this makes for obvious tactical advantage. You know, it's a, a practice commonly used in megalithic uh, you know, states of the ancient world, uh, like Jordan would be a good example. Um, Portugal has some of these kind of crazy type ruins. I know that Spain has some too. But basically where massive outcrops of bedrock are used as the foundation of a fortress because it can be so impregnable, so strong, so awesome, right? And so you build your town there, partially by carving, partially by adding on. And this is how Ramthas began. Pardon the slurping. Um, so what's really going on here that's interesting? Well, first of all, this is the seat of one of the kingships of Alfheim. And this is something I've never openly answered or, or committed to in Alfheim because there are two seats of kingship in Alfheim to rule the entire continent. And that's Grey, which is the oldest city in Alfheim, and Ramthas, which is the most militarily impregnable city in Alfheim. So I think a fun storyline that right away should pop up in your mind is the conflict of who the true king is in this world. And this is something interesting because the players could be caught in this sort of shearing force of the world, right? So in Ramthas, you have a more dwarven sort of influence on the world. And I mean, you guys know how I am. I believe that dwarves are the stronger race. They're the, the more militarily capable race as opposed to humans. But then the human element would be more scholar-based. It would be more like this, this lineage, right? The, the rightful uh, heir or kingship. And there's something very interesting here, but just for the sake of this little piece, we want to talk about Ramthas and what's interesting here. Well, first of all, this is where King Akram ruled, and he's the only king to ever fully unify the entire continent. And he's gone, so if you've read the first novel, um, you know, spoiler, but it's been out for <laughs> quite a while, he's killed in the Primordius, which is like the early sort of formative time when the planets were assembling. And his absence is a huge part of building any campaign, I think, um, or, dis or going through his, his death. Or maybe you retcon your world and King Akram is still alive in your time, but I imagine him as the most magnanimous of all kings in Alfheim. And him being gone, I think, is a good seed for more adventures. But there's something interesting here. Ramthas was his seat of power. And so what does that mean? You have a town that was built and blossomed and reached its full height in a time when a military dwarven king was in power. And that makes for a lot of interesting detail. So there's going to be bunkers, there's going to be defenses, there's going to be vaults. The forges in this place will be legendary because they were manufacturing this war machine. They're making all this armor and swords and weapons and siege machines to wage war on the dark forces of Alfheim, which in Akram's time were elves. So this is another thing that you can play with with Ramthas, is this is a place where elves are not going to be welcome. Now you could have a future which is brighter, 
where elves are being accepted, but you're going to have always this sort of old guard or, you know, outdated older dwarves who refuse to ever be friends with elves. I know this is a classic trope, but here is the place in Alfheim where this trope lives, is that the military high day or, or you know, uh, fluorescent times of this town have passed, and now what? And I think this is interesting for Ramthas. Like, does Ramthas become a desirable location? One of the things I love about Erebor in The Hobbit is that it's a, it's a strategic location. It's this dwarven stronghold that is centrally located, and it makes sense for dark forces to want it. I like that a lot, and here is your chance to play with that in Alfheim. It is Ramthas Rock. So let's say we even take it beyond the elves. Let's take it somewhere darker, like the snow orcs. So the snow orcs reach, for some weird reason, which which is another story hook, they reach this new height in population, and they actually gain enough population and momentum to take Ramthus Rock. Now this would be a huge coup in Alfheim. This would be crazy. This would be like orcs taking Minas Tirith. So now you have Ramthas being controlled by snow orcs and they're starting to delve into the deeper vaults and the forges. And if they get in there and they find all those magic weapons and they start to manufacture their own war machine, they're going to be unstoppable. And here's a great campaign seed for your players. is for people to put down their differences, go out and try to retake Ramthas. And of course the siege is happening, but playing out sieges in a campaign isn't terribly interesting. So the players are sent on this kind of side mission to go under or to go around and to sort of infiltrate or destroy the snow orc war machine inside Ramthas on the down low. And here's your campaign. So Ramthas to me is fun to use. It's like this anvil. It's the the biggest, hardest, most brutally reinforced military city in Alfheim. So what you do for your story is you give it to evil forces and then set your players against it. The other option would be to go back in time to... Akram's day to the high times of Ramthas when they're fighting the elves and to be part of that. So to relive some of the sort of epic history of Alfheim through Ramthas Rock, to go back to the glory days and and to relive those or maybe to sway a decisive battle. Or maybe you have a twisted version of history where there's this battle that was lost by the forces of good, but someone went back in time to try to change that and it actually had catastrophic results. So you guys have all know the, the butterfly effect, right? Which is like, well, we need to go back and spare all these lives. And it's like, well, yeah, but the sacrifice of all those lives are what created this series of events that chained together to make the world a better place eventually. Their sacrifice mattered. So if you go back and you save all those people, actually it changes events in a bad way. And when you return to the present, there's a, a race of mechanical spiders that actually <clears throat> is control of Ramthas Rock. <laughs> And then playing with those alternate timelines and how this is going to affect the military core of Alfheim. And here's where a lot of these stories can fluoresce. And if you're digging for more detail on what Ramthas would be like, just simply look at Minas Tirith. You know, it's these bedrock cut uh, structures. Or look at um, Petra in Jordan, which is, you know, this series of buildings that are cut into raw bedrock. and, And you get a lot of feeling for what this could be like. Even the the way they used Petra in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the way the traps felt and the architecture felt, there's a lot of fodder there for creating your own feeling of what it's like to find the deeper parts of Ramthas or to be inside it during a siege or to be jumping off of it, base jump, you know, flying a goblin glider off the top of this thing. I don't know. There's all kinds of possibilities. But this is a massive bedrock anvil of military power in Alfheim, and that's your theme to play with. And then the, the falling or the rising of the dwarven kings is the sort of the, the spoon in your soup that's going to stir the story. So that's what Ramthas Rock is all about. And I know it's just mentioned in passing here and there, but if you look at your Alfheim map, you're instantly going to start to see seeds. Maybe actually the Ant-Men rise up out of the molten mountains and they want to take Ramthas. And that's an interesting, whoa, who, who wants Minas Tirith to be ruled by Ant-Men? I mean, th- that, that sounds absolutely horrible. So there's stuff to play with. So that's Ramthas Rock, the, the seat of military power. So something to, to mull over. Do a, do a good, solid mull.
Okay, next we're going to talk about Gray, the oldest city in Alfheim. So if it's going to be that old, it even has to be older than like the pyramids and Coab and stuff like that, right? This is an ancient, ancient site. Now, the way that I'd like to imagine it, I always like to, to give a comparison maybe of where my ideas came from or just the most known version, but I imagine this a lot like Sharn in Eberron, uh, the creation of Keith Baker in D&D. And this is a town of towers. This is a city of these big blocky towers. Um, and they've started as, you know, little sort of square foundational buildings way back in the Serpent Kingdom days. So this city was definitely a city of snake men at one point. That right there should get your imagination turning. So there's still like stone effigies of serpents, or maybe they've been destroyed or marred. Maybe there's, they're buried, and maybe all the city hasn't been discovered, and there's a serpent city sort of quadrant that's still buried or being discovered or being excavated. But maybe for the sake of history, some of the, the serpent architecture is still there. Maybe it's built so well it's not destroyable, and so people have just learned to live with it. But I like the age being the, the power word or theme word here for this city. So if you're role-playing in your campaign in the city of Grey, this is what I would play with is the, the theory of really, really old age. And then unveiling that. Even Inglemore would seem young compared to Grey. And so I think the theme that I would like to play with in Grey is this a little bit of like a feeling of library, this feeling of a repository. This is the oldest and most complete set of knowledge, of books, of magic, uh, and of sort of deep secrets and secret societies in all of Alfheim. This is the, this is the nest of sort of pseudo-urban culture in my world. Now, I'm very hesitant to get into any like this sort of advanced civilization stuff in my world because I feel like it gets out of hand. It's a slippery slope. And then suddenly you have like lightning trains like in Eberron, which I don't think belong in Alfheim, which is a much lower fantasy. So what you do is you just keep their information technology very rudimentary. It's scrolls and old books. But the thing I would have happening is that in gray, they're constantly uh, uncovering, moving, rearranging, restoring, and caring for the knowledge storage of Alfheim. They're, they're always caring for these books. They're moving around, kind of like the maesters in Game of Thrones, right? There's this whole culture that cares for, restores, and transcribes books and scrolls. And herein lies your adventure seeds. So anything that involves a theme of a, a forbidden book, like you know, a heretical book, is really cool. Or maybe some player characters who actually become employed in this effort of knowledge curation. Maybe there are schools of magic that are secretly vying for control of Grey. You, maybe you're in a time when the king of Grey is in conflict with the, the overall king, the, uh, the high king of Alfheim, which would be in Ramthas. Maybe you're in a time like I have been in my recent stories, which is that Henrik, the lord of Grey, is the current high king of Alfheim. And by some strange set of events, this conflict is set in motion of like, well, who really is the high king is what's being asked. And what conflict can that create? And then there are scrolls and books and ancient knowledge that somehow play a part in who the high king is. So delving into the city of Grey, I think could be challenging as a dungeon master because advanced civilizations are highly complicated. So I would say tread lightly here. This could be difficult. But if you can pull off a dense ancient city, almost imagine like Barcelona, right? Or Paris or Venice, but built 10 times taller. Venice is a pretty good one, right? I mean, minus the canals, but this, this feeling of an ancient, ancient housing of some of the highest culture, or like Naples would be a good example, or Milan, right? This, this sort of uh, old world that has been very well preserved, painstakingly preserved, and where all knowledge from all over Alfheim has been gathered, and the intrigue and the complexity of that knowledge storage behavior is where you're going to get your adventures and your excitement. And so that's Grey. And remember, there's King Henrik. He's called the Falcon, and he's like a really good king. But maybe he falls, you know, like it's one of my classic twists that I mentioned in the core, right? Is you show up at the summoning of the king and he welcomes you. And then just right as he's reaching his hand out to you, he like turns green and falls over dead. And this is the beginning of the story. Someone assassinated 
the Falcon, King Henrik, one of the greatest kings that's ever been known, and now it's time to figure it out. And an assassination, especially a poisoning, is perfect for this setting. Another great reference could be the movie uh, The Name of the Rose with Sean Connery. It's, you know, surrounding this heretical book. It's got poison pages. It moves around. People are dying. It's like a murder mystery. And like, wow, that fits Grey perfectly. So that's just what I wanted to talk about with Grey is like, consider this old library culture. Put it here. And, you know, you don't have to use Grey. You don't have to use Alfheim. It's the idea that's more interesting for me. And I especially would choose a couple of like these really cool, you know, old bearded librarian type characters to be my NPCs, you know, beware the poison pages. You know? <laughs> Any excuse to do old man voice and I'm on board. <laughs> and so if you're running your campaign in gray, you're going to be doing old man voice like inside and out, top to bottom. Okay, the next one that I wanted to talk about is really underwritten and barely mentioned. Actually, the next two. Um, that we're going to talk about here are, are really underwritten and there's not much detail at all available. And I just wanted to bring it out for our 20th episode of RPG Mainframe. And first of all is the Wardens. So if you look at your Alfheim map, there are a few of these ancient trees. Now, especially there's one that's called out called The Warden up in Eyer, uh, north of Eridrum. And these are titanic pine trees. These, uh, the trunks of these pine trees at their base are probably the size of uh, maybe a small residential block. So maybe, you know, four houses or five houses on a side in a square, if you can imagine how, how big that might be. Um, you know, maybe 120 yards in diameter would be the size of this trunk of this tree. And the thing is massively tall and older really than, almost than anything. I mean, this is, it's as old as bedrock. Um, and here's where you play with it. Okay, so what, what are these things? Uh, obviously, it's inspired a little bit by some of the towns in World of Warcraft, right, which the elves build on these massive trees. But more interestingly, what I wanted to play with is the idea of protecting these trees. And you can have as many of these as fit your world. You know, you can have one, which is in the ire, and there's just only one warden left. Or you could have them in a series, and maybe there's, you know, like four of them, and they're at the sort of the poles of the world. And deep down in their root systems, they can actually communicate and, and maybe even have a portal system that goes from warden to warden. But I think what's fun here, and I, I know this has come up in a few of the Feyrun campaigns over the years too, is this idea that the wardens sort of house this life force that is critical to the survival of the overall world. And the, the players are going to set out on this mission to protect or preserve these wardens because their root systems are beginning to die. Or maybe one of them has already died. Or maybe they're being burned. Or whatever. You can pick a, a numerous, any number of explanations, but the wardens are in danger. There you go. That's what I wanted to propose. And so uh, if you look at some of my writing in Ire, the coal demons are sort of coming out and they want to burn this thing because the roots of the Warden go so deep that the Underdark like, can't be delved by evil forces. It's that powerful. And so they need to remove this sort of like anchor stone of good in our world for them to continue to grow as a kingdom, right? The demonic kingdom. And so this creates not only a focal point for the conflict for your players, but like uh, to me, a lot of seeds of themes. Tree themes can be really elegant and beautiful in a good campaign. Tree themes, you know, attract, you know, players who like the sort of nature domain as far as like rangers and, you know, nature clerics and other things like this. But also they just give you a lot of visual cues that can be fun to play with. You're going to be doing like deep forest gameplay. You're going to be doing underground gameplay where there's roots, funguses, insects, like weird sap. You know, maybe even the sap that forms amber from a, a warden is a super powered material in your world. So like a droplet of this this amber from a thousand years ago that these uh, the wardens form, it contains this power, but it has to be consumed or melted or destroyed in order to release this power. And actually, there's very little amber left and so on and so forth. Maybe the demons have discovered how to use amber and, and they're becoming more powerful. Maybe they're actually mining the warden for this sap. But I think what's important here about the story isn't the details of where it goes, but the thematic cues that you get out of a tree-themed campaign. Like the cover or sort of core image of your campaign is this great big pine tree. To me, that already is so evocative. Like, 
what are we going to do here? Is, is it sort of a wintry world? Is it a mountainous world? A forested world? And I think you get into all these ideas, and it's vastly different from something like Grey or Ramthas, which are these urban kind of campaign feels. This one is all about the wild and, and the heart of the wild. And so maybe there are guardians of the warden, and they're like these sort of wolf creatures, or maybe they're like bear creatures that, that you know, kind of come forth down out of the woods to guard the warden. There's a town that's built around the base of the warden, but maybe the roots have become like, you know, violent. And there's like these upheavals where these huge roots, like as big as streets, are cracking up through the town and destroying the town because the warden is sort of angry or going through a life cycle. Maybe the pine cones from the warden are triggered by fire like a ponderosa pine. And there's a big fire around it and these things drop and they're as big as houses and they open and instead of seeds in there, are these, these sort of tree elemental creatures or or, you know, plant monsters of some kind that are made to defend the warden. And you need to actually make allies with them because you're on their side. You need to fight the demons together, not fight them. And like that whole experience, the way it plays out, oh my God, there's a ton of ideas. And there are also plenty of D&D modules out there which uh, orbit around trees, right? There's the Sunless Citadel with the way, you know, that this evil druid has poisoned this great tree. Plenty of fodder there to play with. Um, there's even on Critical Role, they did that great adventure with the tree under the city. And so it, it's a theme that's popped up here and there, but here's your chance and your location to play with this tree theme in Alfheim. I especially love the idea that down in the roots, there's this amber membrane that connects through a magic portal the wardens throughout Alfheim. That seems really fun to me. So it would be a, a shortcut way to get to like, you know, the polar ice or down into the desert or the far eastern side of the continent in an instant. So that's the idea behind the Wardens. So if you're working on a sort of a tree-themed campaign, this could be a linchpin or a focal point for you that could provide lots of fodder. Remember too, you can always go up, not just into the root systems, but up into the branches, into like an Ewoky type setting, right? <laughs> not necessarily Ewoks in particular, but the, the architecture and the settings that come from a treetop world. You know, rope bridges and, you know, high places and long falls and huts and fire being very dangerous and this kind of, you know, arboreal tone to things, almost like in Flash Gordon, right, um, with the world of the tree men and all the ideas that go with it, especially that ritual, you know, where you, the stump beast, you put your hand in there and this scorpion creature stings you and if you live, you can join the tribe and like, it's just, there's ideas just everywhere when it comes to this sort of tree culture and the warden is your place to play with it. We're still trucking on our deep dive here into Alfheim lore for episode 20. And the next area I wanted to talk about is the Molten Mountains. Now this area has, is completely unwritten. It only has a couple little bullet points and worlds and that's it. But this is a central eastern Alfheim and it is a volcanic mountain range where these ant men are. Now the fundamental story hook here is, is in the book, which is that the ant men have taken this god forge, which is basically a magma powered forge that the dwarves made centuries ago, but they've taken it and they currently control it and the, the dwarves hate this. They want it back and so there's an intrinsic conflict between the almost countless forces of the Ant-Men, there's just legions of them, and the dwarves of the local area, both of Ramthus, of the Wall and that whole area. And they're battling these Ant-Men to take back this forge, which is a, a huge forge built right on a giant vein of magma or just an active, a, a sort of a low activity volcano that's been contained and channeled. So there's always this access to like raw liquid stone coming out of the earth, both for its heat, as well as for sort of scooping it up into slag and then forming that slag into metal and alloys and other things. And here's your chance to play with your lava theme. So you can go into some of these mountains and play with, you know, lava rivers and rising and falling lava, explosions of magma and burning rocks and tunnels with black sort of sooty walls and all those kind of themes that start to, you know, expand. But it also lets you play 
with the surface, which is more where the magma is a tool. It's almost like uh, like the canals in Denmark. You know, it's like the magma has been contained in a way where these forges can work nonstop. Maybe they're like you know billowing black soot and smoke up out of them, like Isengard, and then you can play with that kind of theme. Maybe the Ant Men are building something like a giant like war golem out of like this super refined alloy that they make from um, the the magma that's pouring out of the molten mountains. Maybe all your players need to do is just cross the molten mountains. It's just something that's in the way of their journey, uh, like in uh, Wolves and Wonders. And just getting through it, just getting through the Ant Men's territory is their only challenge. They're not there to try to do some big quest. They're just trying to make it. That, to me, would also be a really fun campaign or series of adventures. Um, but I think your, your most sort of epic piece here is the God Forge. The players need to go use the God Forge to make a certain item. And to me, that just sounds awesome. So you're going to have a combination of dwarven magma themes and alloy themes, metallic themes like war golems, war forged, you know, metal spider creatures and like, you know, insanely powerful weapons and armor. But then you twist it a little bit because the Ant-Men have taken this and the Ant-Men are using all this technology. Maybe they're actually making like this metal ant army or something. I don't know. Maybe the queen like sort of sits on the God Forge as her throne. And she's like, you know, has these, you know, huge metal appendages and she's like becoming this magma metal ant queen creature. And she, if she gets too powerful, you know, she's going to take Alfheim and de destroy it or devour it or whatever. And like the players need to go mess around. But either way, once again, like all these things I'm kind of hitting you guys with, I I'm not as interested in exactly what happens as I am in providing this sort of seed of what could happen. Maybe they've even developed a technology of metal that is that is cannot be melted. It is absolutely fireproof. And so they can sort of skiff on the magma. They can actually have like little boats and and they can move transport and supplies and stuff on magma canals with these like duranium skiffs. Maybe the Ant-Men have contacted off-world forces from Warp Shell. And they're actually one of the sources for creating duranium in some future universe. Maybe they also have a time rip or maybe they have a teleportation riff of some kind where they're contacting a spacefaring culture. And actually, this is one of the few places in the universe where duranium can be smelted. Now you're really pushing it to an epic level, right? And how does that interact with players? And what does this mean? And maybe they're actually even making like colliders, like these kind of starfaring engines that are made by the Ant-Men as, as part of their economy and their rise to power. And these engines are sought after in the more starfaring culture of Warp Shell. And now you have like a bridge here that's forming, right? Between Warp Shell and Alfheim in an interesting way and discovering that and whoa, holy, oh my gosh, cool. So this is what I wanted to play with with the Molten Mountains and I've just never gotten around to it yet. It's also sort of odd because it's near Gem Glacier and the glaciers where all the sort of ice drakes live. And maybe you could have fire drakes and they hate the ice drakes and they, there's a war happening there. And maybe ant men ride drakes. I mean, like, wah! There's just so many possible seeds and that's what I want to sort of throw out to you guys and make for some interesting listening here on the RPG mainframe. So give a look at the Molten Mountains and uh, you know how lava adventures are. They're just stinking cool. They're just awesome. So... Why not try some uh, lava adventure? You know, and if you really want to shrink it down to its most essential version, you can just say there's a one-shot or a little side quest where the players need to go here to retrieve a duranium weapon or a duranium piece of armor. That's it. And then you have your ideas for what the setting's going to be. It's going to be Ant-Men curating, excavating, and working with lava and metal themes. So to me, that's all you need almost right there to start building a dungeon and a series of adventures. So that's the Molten Mountains. Oh yeah, man. That sounds fun to me. Okay, so we just got a little hint of maybe a way that Alfheim could be connected to Warp Shell via the Molten Mountains, right? But for the next th sort of three bullets that I have on my, my podcast today, 
I wanted to talk about these type of ideas and what these connections are. And so my little bullets that I'm looking at right here are three. There's the gateways to Ironheart, the gateways to Ghost Mountain, and the Starfarers, which could also be called the gateways to Warp Shell. So I like seeing Alfheim and fantasy characters. They're all in a bit of a hub. And the hub is the center point of four worlds that you can play with. There's Alfheim, Warp Shell, Ironheart, and Ghost Mountain. The idea that these places are not only interconnected, but that their fates are intertwined and that you can travel between them to me is fascinating. So you take your Alfheim characters and have them pop into Ghost Mountain when it's discovered that there's this... <coughs> that... <coughs> And you have them popping back and forth between those places. And even your fantasy characters appear in Ghost Mountain when they discover that there's this huge Yogg deposit that was torn away in Ghost Mountain. So the idea that your fantasy world links to Ironheart, which is your crazy, weird, you know, the, the, the shattered moon that orbits Earth, the home of Alfheim, right? This is a broken moon that's unstable in time and kind of has like a Flash Gordon type infinite tech fantasy feel to it. can be really anything you can dream up, but it's the home to the card game. And then the fact, so you have that, then you have Ghost Mountain. So you have access to a Wild West setting, but you're like a guy with a sword. And then you also have the Starfarers or the links to Warp Shell, which is another great one, which is the fantasy character who finds himself in a spacefaring setting and vice versa. You can have your Torton with a chem rail who is plopped into your fantasy setting. And this is just, to me, is ripe with fun. It's, it's why I loved Spelljammer so much. Um, when our second edition group got into Spelljammer, we just had a blast because it opened up all this sci-fi and we had a very Dune-like story going with still suits and the spice and the vying houses and all this kind of stuff. Okay, so what are the links? Let's just break it down. So gateways to Ironheart. Well, in recent times, I've proposed that there are a series of dungeons which have portals to Ironheart, and the first one is Odium. So you guys have heard about the Eyes of Odium. It turns out, and, and you know, after this wipe, I can kind of reveal a little more of this, but Odium is this sort of creature that is a dungeon. It's kind of like the Tectura from Warp Shell, right? But it has these two portals in it, and the portals directly lead to Ironheart. So you can actually look through them and look back down on Earth from Ironheart, which is a bit of a mind bender. But what's interesting here is that that's where the power is coming from, is kind of what I'm suggesting, is that Ironheart, the reason it's split apart and it's so volatile, the, the force of magic power is in the core of Ironheart. That's why it's sort of blown apart and it's exposed. If you guys have ever watched Savages of Kath, this links to that storyline as well, is that every 53 years, Ironheart gets a little too close to Alfheim, and the heat and the energy coming off the broken core of that moon is so intense it can actually like burn entire forests and stuff. So there could be a great connection here between the portals that are underground in Alfheim leading to Ironheart, and Ironheart then in turn sort of watching over Earth, and your players getting to move back and forth between those is, wow, that just, whoa. <laughs> There's a lot of fun to be had there. So the gateways to Ironheart are literally these portals that if you look into them, you can see the sort of shattered um, landscape of Ironheart from underneath Alfheim. So now the gateways to Ghost Mountain, in the adventures that I've run, these gateways are sort of called the Wizard's Door. And I would actually begin to propose that this is what the sort of fabled wizard lock is. You know, the, the glyph of ICRPG has something to do with this. It is one of the, the gateways that allows you to go to Ghost Mountain and back. And allows actually Ghost Mountain to feature um, fantasy monsters like the Invincibles from Doom Vault. And, and how that's interesting. So you have gunslingers battling an Invincible in Ghost Mountain, but then conversely, you have Alfheim characters who might be wandering out into Ghost Mountain and confronting Satan <laughs> down in the depths of the Dead Pinnacles to reclaim the Yogg and then bring them back because the Yogg can heal Ironheart. And you see how you can twist all these worlds together into sides of your Rubik's Cube. But either way, the gateways to Ghost Mountain, to me, should be made possible only by extremely powerful wizard magic. 
It's not like Ironheart. The, the, the gateways, the portals to Ironheart are almost like these natural conduits or wormholes. But you only move between Ghost Mountain and Alfheim with, with potent arcane force that is harnessed by a caster. They cast this doorway. And going through it can be volatile or can be a one-way trip or can be, you know, violent or can destroy your gear or something like that. Um, but it's an arcane spell. And maybe even to link it back to what we were talking about before, in gray there is this heretical book that actually describes how to use these glyphs to go to Ghost Mountain because there's a, a cult that actually wants to help Satan get this sort of deposit of Yog so that it's not taken away by God and like, oh my gosh. So I just want to propose all these interlinkages, not to tell you which one is going to be the coolest, but to get your brain turning. Okay, so then finally we have the Starfarers, which is my most um, openly visible link to Warp Shell. So you guys know about Xenos down off the southern coast of Alfheim. This is the biggest one. So this is a massive, massive starship that's like the size of the Greek islands that's mostly submerged, but inside of it, it's this high-tech spaceship that was used by like a gigantic alien race. And this alien race is from Warp Shell. You could even link it to um, Absolute Tabletop's Harbinger world and say that this is like a chunk of or an entire Harbinger that crashed into the ocean here. And there's a link there. You could just have it be a big crazy spaceship that can be reactivated, you know, almost like the abyss where those huge alien ships rise up out of the ocean. You could just find records or data inside this ship that lead to a revelation about how to access the warp shell universe. You could have a crashed warp shell that's floating under the water. Or it could be like in, um, oh, what was that crazy one called? Where they lived out that whole fantasy, but the whole time their ship had been crashed underwater. Um, Pandorum. Right? So you could have your players be the crew on this ship, and they think they're traveling through space, but the whole time they've been like under the ocean in Alfheim. And like, whoa. <laughs> right? And... There's a lot of possibilities, but either way, what you do is you use the Starfarer as a doorway of story to access space travel for your fantasy characters or vice versa to bring your sci-fi characters into the fantasy world where there would be real badasses. If you've noticed, the warp shell loot is really powerful. So maybe the Starfarers have already landed and the fantasy characters from Alfheim need to seek out their help to defeat a drake or to defeat the Ant-Men or something like this. But either way, what I want to propose in this little podcast piece is that these two things are interchangeable. You can just play. Just play. Let the worlds mix. And the root or the anchor point of this mixture is the Starfarers down in Xenos. Okay, I have three more items here. And the first one is the Colossi. So we have the fallen Colossi in Alfheim. They're on the map, right? And this idea entirely comes from Nausicaa. Right? There's, there was this war where these giant weaponized sort of behemoths were created. They stomped all over the universe, ran out of magic power, and kind of stumbled and fell and now are in ruin. Evil forces are trying to awaken them to, to do evil things again. And there's your storyline. I have written and conceived of almost nothing for this stuff. I don't know what is inside them, how they function. But the idea also came from uh, Breath of the Wild, right? The newer Zelda game where there are these huge giants that are so big that there are dungeons inside of them. And maybe they are awakening, and they're beginning to stand up and walk, and you're in it while it's walking. Um, the, actually, the original ICRPG campaign that I played to playtest first edition was inside the South Colossus, which is like this huge worm with a pyramid for a head. <laughs> and it was powered on human souls and all this craziness and... Really fun stuff, but I just want to invite you to play with it. Play with the Colossi. Just make them whatever you want them to be. Bring them back to life. Have them destroy gray. You have to get inside the thing and stop it or control it. A lot of stuff could happen. Next one is the orc storyline. Now, obviously, the Runehammer novel trilogy is all about the orc storyline, which is that orcs were created by elves uh, as a sort of a way to, to take elven ugliness and store it and they stored it in this slave race but then the orcs rose up they became free they're kind of hated but they're a noble people they're not like villains like in so many worlds and, and the orcs are trying to preserve their bloodline they're trying to survive in a world that dislikes them even though they're not evil and what storylines could come out of this maybe you have players that come up as young orcs and they're confronted with this sort of you know sort of downtrodden life 
of their people and they need to rise up. Maybe there's an orc rebellion. Maybe there's a, a force within the orcs that is evil and they're giving the orcs a bad name and they need to be stopped. You know, this could be the snow orcs. Maybe the snow orcs now have a leader. And so the snow orcs make the world right in hating the orcs. And so they have to be eliminated because they're just making everything worse and we have to go infiltrate and stop them. Maybe the orcs join forces against the Ant-Men with other cultures and you guys are the vanguard of that and so on and so forth. I just want to invite you to consider the simple flip that orcs are good guys in this world. And you could be one of them and what stories could arise. And then finally, I mentioned it a little bit with Westberg, but the Time Eaters. Wow, I, I wonder if my microphone heard that. Apparently I need to eat breakfast, but... How do the Time Eaters create storylines? How, how is this happening? What, how do you fall into the rift? How do you, maybe you can ride these worms that eat time. Maybe they can be tamed. Maybe they can be talked to. Maybe they're actually the souls of fallen kings that have been trapped in these enormous creatures. Or maybe they're just forces of nature like in Dune. And a sort of a prophetic character, a Muad'Dib character, could communicate with these time-eating worms and realize that they're not eating time. They're healing the time wound, which was created way back in the beginning or way at the end of the timeline. And that wound needs to be healed to repair the sort of cosmic level damage that's been done uh, to Alfheim uh, when the Primordius was battled over. Anyway, the, I just want to show you and share with you guys how these ideas fold and unfold. And I don't necessarily want to say what is the truth of this world, but where are the areas that could just be ripe with opportunity? And even this, I don't think, is an exhaustive list. I'm just I'm running out of voice power here. But I hope it was interesting listening and just basically exploring with you guys a little bit why I made the world the way that I made it. I, I intended it to be ripe with possibility, but not ripe with all the answers. And I hope that it's, it's played in for, for years to come. Um, I know that our group keeps playing in it and expanding upon it and delving into its themes, um, especially the crisscross between Ghost Mountain, Warp Shell, and Alfheim, I think is what's become the real wealthy kind of um, rich heart of our group is that we all have this context for playing in all these different worlds together and, that, and it's starting to blur. And I think that's very interesting. And having all those worlds in the same system I think is the fun that we're starting to experience. Granted, it's taken us, geez, almost a year of playing to start to reach some of these dividends, but it is what we set out, you know, last, last fall, I think it was. We basically said, man, I want to have a long-running group that has all this deep context, and we're working toward that goal, and I hope that you guys are working toward that goal because it's cool. It's the very dividends that our hobby is all about. It's a lot of fun, and nothing's better than just hanging with your homies every week and reconnecting with other human beings to tell epic stories for the sake of telling epic stories. Hell yeah. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot for tuning in to Runehammer. That is all I've got for now. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. We made it to 20 podcasts. Every month, you guys make my bills hurt a lot less, and I get to continue to survive as a full-time RPG content creator, and I owe it in huge part to you guys. Um, so please check out all the newest stuff, uh, especially that trilogy book. Uh, if you can afford to grab a copy on Amazon, that would really uh, make my day and warm my heart because deep down I really do want to be writing more novels. It's really enjoyable. I know it isn't the, the, the burning core of our hobby, but it's really challenging and fascinating to write novel-length stories. It's, it's really exciting to me. And so that's going on. I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to go get some breakfasts. Maybe bacon sandwich up in here. And uh, you guys, have a great week. May your dice roll high. I will talk to you soon. Thank you once again, patrons. And welcome all you new patrons. Everybody, my dwarven shield wall, now more than 400 shields strong. We are going to push into the second half of 2018. And we're going to play D&D like a bunch of big old badasses. So join me doing that, and it's going to be a good future. All right, this is Hank from Fernell. I'm signing off for now. Keep it real. Do not steal. You're always going to get a deal. I'll see you on the Internet, guys. Mm -hmm.